Hi, everybody. Thanks to be here for this talk. Um, I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been um, doing Java for, well, this year it will be 20 years, so I consider myself quite an old developer. Uh, my work was mainly in Java, um, though since a couple of years I also dabble in Kotlin. I like Kotlin a lot. And a couple of months ago, I, I started learning Rust. I tried Go, but I didn't like it that much, especially regarding the exceptions. And I wanted to like delve into a low level language and well, it's pretty good. Uh, I'm also a developer advocate since three years. And now Rudy, it's up to you. Yes, so yeah, my name is Rudy de Busser. Um, I try to beat you uh, because I'm already 25 years a developer. Um, <laughs> So I am definitely old. Um, um, I've, I've worked all the time in Java, or most of the time that in Java, and uh, mainly in Jakarta EE. And these days I'm looking over the products of Payara as product manager and also developer advocate doing fun things like this one. So let's get rolling with that Hazelcast story. Let's do it. I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, feel free to tell me, hey, you forgot to unmute yourself. Um, so I, 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 I assume that you are uh, familiar with Hazelcast and at least Hazelcast in memory data grid. And the idea behind Hazelcast memory data grid is you've got one, like say, single computing facade. The idea is, well, here is the, definition from the Hazelcast uh, website. But I, I mean, the idea is you've got one single facade and then you can have as many nodes behind it as necessary, Hazelcast. And then if it's embedded with Payara, Payara takes care of everything. Think about having like um, a MongoDB um, uh, database or any database that you have clustered you don't care that much about how many nodes, about the topology, about anything. You just care about sending like requests, getting response, sending statements, whatever. So we have this data grid. This data grid gives you like storage and computing power. And on this data grid, we have a couple of available structures. We have, of course, collections and in general collection they mimic the collections you know from the GK. So we have an IMAP for a standard map. We have an I list for the standard list. We have a queue. We also have ring buffer, multi-map. Well, we have a lot of collections. We have topic. We have also some structures dedicated to con concurrency. So the idea would be, hey, you can use one of such structure to create your own lock so you can develop your application and have a single unified lock. And that sounds super cool. But the problem is the cap theorem. Because I told you, hey, as a developer, that's fine. You have a single computing unit. But you still need to understand what happens behind a bit. And behind a bit, what happens is we have multiple nodes. And then it's a distributed system. And because it's a distributed system, it's bound by the cap theorem. And the cap theorem says, hey, you've got three properties, consistency, availability, and let's say tolerance to partitioning, because your network probably at some point will get split for any reason. It can be physical. It can be at any level of the OSI, uh, OC, uh, OSI uh, uh, layer. There can be an issue with the network. So we, we have way to cope with that. but actually you can only choose two of those capabilities. By default, Hazelcast is AP. So of course, since distributed system, we have to choose like tolerance to partitioning and we choose availability over consistency. And then remember I told you, hey, like we have this uh, atomic long, which is not great if it's available, but it might be consistent or not. So some of the structures, notably atomic long, can be used in CP mode, and that should be the mode 
that you should use them in, otherwise you will have no warrant. And of course, I believe that if you know about hassle costs, you probably know about the single most used structures. You might not know about the others, but the one that is most used is the map. And in general, the map is used for caching. And with hassle costs, what you can do is you don't need to do this kind of stuff of cache aside. So the cache aside is the idea that actually your code will be the choreographer, sorry, will be the orchestrator between the cache and the data store. So it will say, hey, if I have the value in the cache, then I return the value. If I don't have the value in the cache, I will get the value from the data store. I will set the value in the cache. That's one of the most basic examples that is available in every library. But some cache providers, such as Hazelcast, give you much more power. Because with cache aside, by reading, it's not fun. But by writing, the problem is you are doing dual writes. And you must choose, hey, will I first write to the database? And then it works in the database. Then I need to write to the DB, uh, sorry, to the cache. But then it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. And then I have consistency issue. So in general, what you want to do is to have single writes and, of course, single reads. And this is through cache through. So here, what you can do with Hazelcast, especially again with the map, is you get the value from the cache. And if it's in the cache, it will return you the value. If it's not in the cache, the cache itself will read the value from the data store and set it itself. So your code only interacts with one single facet. In that case, it's Hazelcast. And you don't need to be the orchestrator. And once you start doing that, your cache becomes a data source like any other. And it can provide you some very interesting insights. And as additional benefits, of course, that the reason you are using it, it has faster access than the data store, probably because it's in memory, whereas your data store in general is stored on file, and because it's closer to the application. Your cache will probably contain more data than your persistent storage. For example, sessions, HTTP sessions. HTTP sessions, you rarely store them on file. You keep them in memory. And so you have this additional data that you can leverage. Sometimes your cache also might be your data store. So I, I talked about sessions, but <clears throat> we are very like rigid, at least I am, especially old people like me. I, for a long time, believed, hey, data storage, a data store is only a database. And the database is either a regular database, a legacy database, or some NoSQL database. But if you are guaranteed that you will keep your data at the end of the run of the cache, that it will persist on disk, for example, then your cache might be your data store with all the benefits. <clears throat> and so the question now becomes, Rudy, I leave it up to you. You are muted. <laughs> I have the same problem. So indeed, now the question is, your data is in the cache, but how can you query it? And I'm going to show you an example um, in a moment, a demo where, you, where we um, use four different ways of retrieving data from the cache. Uh, from a map. Uh, as uh, Nicola told you, it's the most used um, structure. But there are a few things that you need to be careful about because it is distributed data. So I'm going to share my screen so that I can take over the presentation and show the demo in a moment. So with distributed data, you always have the issue. Are you going to retrieve the data first and filter it locally? Or, and that's specifically a good thing with, uh, with Hazelcast because uh, we, we mentioned already there is some compute power. 
do you do, do you do you do the filtering remotely and only transfer the results to the node that is um, asking for the data? So that is indeed the best case, and I will show you some um, timings as a demo that that you can clearly see that you should not filter locally. Um, although that is the natural way how we work with maps, eh, because um, what what is uh, more convenient than a developer um, looking at the values of a map and filtering through, through them and return the correct result. But here, of course, the map actually is distributed data, so you should not do it. There was already a long time, I'm not even know how long, but there was already the possibility to use um, some kind of criteria API to do it in, um, in Hazelcast. Um, but okay, not many people knew it, and I think, and maybe um, Nicola can correct me, um, that people should have a more familiar way of looking at data. And also uh, because of that example that he gave of that, uh, that, uh, that how you can use the case as a single facade, why not use the um, filtering in an SQL-like way? Although it is not a real database, but you can do it like that. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the reason why you should never do it um, locally is because suppose you have three different members. Uh, I'll um, recreate this example in a moment. Then mm, you have three different servers, three, three different machines running Hazelcast. And if you store something in the, in the Hazelcast map, the data is not stored on, on one member only. It is distributed. And it is distributed in two ways. You have the primary data partition so that not all data is on one member because if that member goes down, then you lose all the information. So that is, so that he had those nine partitions here as an example, um, they are distributed over those three members. But there is also a backup partition. So if um, member three um, goes away, then the data partitions three, six, and nine are no longer available there, but the backups uh, are available on member one and member two, and they become the primary at that moment. And then you see, of course, if, you are, if your application is connected to that member one, for instance, and it retrieves all the data from a, a certain map, which is stored there, that first, all the data needs to be copied over to that first member, which is not efficient especially if, it, uh, if you are retrieving a lot of data. And so it is better that you leave the filtering up to the members themselves. Uh, so you can give the command to, uh, to filter on the member itself and only transfer the data um, that is uh, valid for that filter to that member one. So that's efficient because you are using three um, three machines uh, for your processing and you only transfer the data what is needed. So also data transfer wise, that's faster. So um, we, uh, with Payare, we are using uh, since beginning of this year for community version and now also for the enterprise version, we are using the Hazelcast platform version four, uh, 4.2 for the moment. Um, but since then, there is already an Hazelcast 5 out, which is uh, the combination of that in-memory data, data grid and some um, streaming capabilities, which, which was um, previously available separately, uh, with, uh, which, which was called JET, uh, Hazelcast JET. So they are now merged uh, together with Hazelcast 5, and we are also planning to uh, include the he has the cost five then in our new version of Payara, which is coming the first half of next year, Payara six, which is aligned with Jakarta EE 10. But also without that chat um, cap capabilities, um, then you will see that you have some kind of um, um, benefits of using Java streams uh, instead of just using for loops. So, in a moment, you will see some uh, the demo and see some uh, the re results, how your code can um, dramatically uh, improve or uh, destroy your per performance. The demo that I give today, uh, that's 
where I use the low level Hazel cost functionality, uh, you will see it in a moment, but we have also deep integrations within Payara uh, and Hazelcast. So we are using Hazelcast as a Jcash provider. Um, so you can store um, data, uh, you can cache data there on, in uh, the um, standard way, in the standardized way uh, with, uh, with Jcash, which is uh, part of the Jakarta EE spec specification. We also use it for uh, the high availability options uh, within, um, within the platform. So if you have a cluster and you need uh, an HTTP session replication between the different members, then we also use um, Hazelcast for that so that all the data is available um, at all endpoints that the end user can, uh, can access. And the clustering itself, uh, what we call the deployment groups uh, in Payara 5 is also based on, on Hazelcast that uh, we have there um, dynamic clusters uh, so that you don't have one cluster where you just assign three servers to it, for instance, but um, one server of that deployment group A can also be part of another deployment group. So you have uh, the deployment group is becoming now a logical entity and not a physical entity uh, like clusters are in many other um, products. Based on that, um, on that, uh, uh, on on those um, options there, uh, which uh, was mentioned there for um, for singletons and locks, etc. We also define a clustered singleton. So uh, you all know that you have a JVM singleton, so only one value um, within your entire JVM. We extend that um, functionality, that feature, to have a single value for an entire cluster. And again, that's then based on that Hazelcast functionality um, so that we can guarantee that there is uh, a single value uh, which, is, uh, which is consistent uh, throughout the entire cluster. And we also use um, Hazelcast to store data. Uh, so for instance, PR Insight, uh, our monitoring solution, um, retrieves data from all the instances and can show you a um, can show you all the data, all the monitoring data in an application with graphs, so that you can follow up on what is happening within your cluster. That's Hazelcast SQL. What I talked about, Ed, so the the uh, the more easy way to. Um, to write those distributed uh, filterings uh, within Hazelcast is not by default available within Payara Micro, um, but you can easily add it as an, an additional jar file. And you can just start using it because you have the access, uh, you have the low level access, as I call it, uh, um, to all the Hazelcast functionality within Payara Micro itself. Um, so you have the entire power of Hazelcast um, at your if, uh, at your fingertips when you are coding some statements. So let's have a look how that looks like. In an example, and I've created here um, an example about countries and the country, um, the country is just uh, a name. So I'm, I have, the data structure which um, compromises of all the countries, that's about 250 or something um, countries in the world. And um, all those countries are also linked to a continent. Uh, so the um, seven continents, if I'm not mistaken, um, is, is also available. And then I have a, a REST endpoint that queries uh, all the countries from a certain continent, for instance. And this Hazelcast instance here is um, at the gateway to the Hazelcast codebase, as I said, as the low level, as we call it. Um, this Hazelcast instance um, is the one which is, um, is linked to uh, the entire cluster uh, to, or to one instance and, and through that um, data grid, which was mentioned uh, to the entire cluster. Uh, so you can um, access that, that there. And for instance, as you normally can do, you request a map. As I, I put, it, uh, put the information in that map somewhere else when the application starts up. 
So I have a, a map there with all countries, which is just a, an, um, the ID as, as, as key value and the country itself as the value entry in the map itself. And I'm using here a stream and um, that was a surprise for me. Um, if I compared using the Java streams uh, in comparison with the for loop, but more on that in a moment. So what I do, I take that uh, all the, the values of that map, and that's not, uh, that's not uh, something special or uh, something specific to Hazelcast or Payara. I filter them based on that continent name. I map um, the name uh, in here in the stream, so uh, because I'm only interested in a list of names, and I join them uh, with uh, each uh, country on a different line. So I can um, compile this, compile this Maven clean package. Uh, it's already done, and then I can start up Payara Micro, for instance, uh, which is available also in this uh, in this directory. And as I mentioned, you need to add the Hazelcast SQL dependency there. Uh, so um, I say that uh, uh, the uh, the 4.2 version, uh, which uh, is uh, aligned with the Hazelcast version that we have internally and need to be added to this um, environment uh, through the add jars uh, option. And then this WAR file, uh, add, so the, our application with, with this endpoint, uh, which calls this um, logic here, which I explained, um, can be deployed, uh, can be started and made available. Once the application is up and running, I can um, query that endpoint. For the moment, I'm going to leave out this silent. I'm going to tell you why I did it. Um, I can curl that endpoint and nothing specific, uh, rest endpoint. So I have defined here as some um, URL that then these are the queries local uh, because it is first retrieving the data locally and then doing the filter on all the countries of Europe, and then you have that list of all the countries. Nothing special, mm, uh, that standard Hazelcast functionality. The reason why I have that silent um, there is so that I can do easier uh, comparison of the timing, so long takes them. Take. So I have here in that query source a um, query parameter. If I put silent to true, then um, I always execute the um, retrieval, of course, but if it's silent, I only return a result, a simple result, because otherwise I always have that long list um, of countries. Uh, and then my timing information um, is not easy readable. So let's see how much time it takes to execute this um, slow execution uh, from a filtering. Um, and this one is the one which I'm going to use with the did distributed one. So I need to change the URL to here to cache SQL. So I can run it several times. It uh, does a bit of warm up. You see it goes always faster and faster. So the, J, the JVM is learning. But you can see that um, that's uh, that's uh, retrieving those data from the Haze, the Haze, the Hazel cost um, structures, uh, filtering it locally, um, et cetera, takes about 86, 85 milliseconds, which is not bad, but the data that I retrieve is only small. Right? It's only 250 um, entries in my map, which is not, not, not that small, but also not that big because you can have sometimes several thousands or um, hundreds of thousands entries. And the thing that I was surprised with um, is that if I don't use this Java streaming option, because I was trying to see uh, what, uh, how fast that, uh, that criteria API was, how fast that SQL was. So I also tried, what if I just do a for loop? So the only difference between the previous one is that I loop over um, that map that I have here and I do the classic uh, if check and I append it to, um, to the string builder which, which returns my string with my result. So if I 
well that was the slow one sorry if i do it then with the streams one i did not look correctly so this one is using the for loop is um, if i'm using the java streams one it is immediately four times faster the only thing that i can think about and i don't know hazelcast enough internally to know it for sure or not but if I'm using it like this in this for loop, probably this for loop only starts when I have the entire, uh, because uh, when I have received the entire data set. With the stream, I probably get already starting filtering the stream when the data is still um, retrieved from the other, um, or the um, Hazel, Hazel, Hazelcast cache, the Hazelcast map. So, um, that's one thing that you need to take care of if you are uh, looking for data in your um, cache system, that maybe a for, for loop is not um, as efficient as a streams one. But we mentioned that you should not filter locally because this filters locally. You should use here what's called a predicate with the query API. And as I mentioned, it is a bit, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, something specific to Hazelcast, so, so you need to learn it a bit. But uh, again, I retrieve the, the, the map here, and then I define um, that I want to have such a predicate builder, and I filter my entities and my values um, within that map uh, based on continent name, and when that is equal to that same parameter there. And then when I have that, um, that per, per, per predicate, I can retrieve uh, the result, uh, the filtered result of uh, my country map uh, through that predicate. And I can uh, loop over uh, the result. And again, at the, um, the output in the same format. When I'm using that version and more consistent, um, Testing is done and I will show you the results uh, in this slide at the end. Then you see that it goes down um, because it's also uh, learning, uh, the JVM is learning and goes faster and faster every time. But on average, you end up more or less on the same value than filtering it locally. Why? I have only one instance. I don't have distributed data. So they're uh, retrieving the, all the data and do it within um, the micro and uh, the Payara uh, microprocess or ask the um, Hazel, Hazelcast predicate um, filtering to do it. Well, it's in the same process. The data are almost at the same um, accessible uh, or almost as fast as accessible. So you don't see any difference, of course. But I also have an example where I do have a really distributed system where data is stored in different nodes. That's the, I think it's even called the legacy method in, um, in Hazelcast documentation now. So instead of using this, why don't we use a format which we are all used to, uh, used working with we we all know how to use queries probably a lot of us or developers know how to query from a table countries where we select the name where the continent name is equals to a certain value when having access to that hazelcast instance which we do have in payar micro you can just say get sql and execute me this sql file so this here is the name of the map it can also be the name of a list and then we loop over the re results and we get the first column, which is name, and we append that again to our result. If, you ex if we execute this one, again, the results are the same. So if I would remove that sign and this true, you would see that you end up with, with the same val values. If we get it some warm up time, you see something interesting, which is not really visible here now but in my more control tests uh, when i did not uh, do sharing of my screen etc 
you you see it more um, more clearly that SQL is faster. So let's switch to a really distributed one to see how that's how how it scales. I have here um, Kubernetes running on my my machine. So again, it is not that efficient because again, all the three servers are running on my machine, but there is still that overhead of um, the transport we have uh, now. So let's try to start up three of the applications instead of only one application, which we had in the previous example, we start up now three different um, bots. They all are linked to the same service. So I can query the service and one of those three pods gives me an answer. Um, and also those three pods, uh, because PR Micro automatically clusters uh, with Hazelcast and uh, within Kube Kubernetes, so they form automatically a cluster. So if I put some data in, uh, in the cache, then it automatically is distributed through those three members uh, that image that I showed you. So we have three um, pods running, so three applications. So if we ask now for the local, uh, so if we do a local filtering, and then I need to make sure that I put here local and the URL is a bit different because I deployed that route within, um, within Kubernetes. You see sometimes various um, timings which are a bit off uh, about instead of the rest, but that's because um, yeah, those other instances, um, it's not around Robin load balancer. So sometimes I'm hitting the same instance. I so call two and three was here the same instance as one. This one and this one was a different one. So, um, but on average, you see that it is slower and uh, you need more time to um, retrieve the data, which is normal because you have to do that transfer. Even more, um, and even more ob ob obvious now, uh, the slow version uh, with, with the for loop, um, it is now all, all the time really slow. It takes about seven to eight times uh, more, uh, seven to eight times slower than using that Java, um, that Java streams options. And this SQL option, again, I need to give it some warm up time. So now I have hit all, all the three of them. You see, it is quite consistent. It takes only about 34, to 37 milliseconds, which is almost exactly the same amount of time that it took when it was not distributed. So if you are a bit lost with all the timings, let me show you the timings results. And so the local way is uh, when you do it, uh, um, air, retrieve the contents of the map and do the filtering uh, with the Java with either a uh, streams or a for loop. Uh, the predicate one is using that um, that SQL, uh, that uh, Hazelcast predicate one and then the SQL version where you use it as a select uh, from table um, just as you do with the database. And if you just use a single one, uh, my, my first test, you just start up one single thing. So there is only one Hazelcast member running then yeah, the local one is more or less at the same time, eh? 38, more or less the same time as the predicate one. So that's not a real difference. SQL one is a bit faster. That's about 20%, um, about 20%, 25% faster. And again, you see there that for loop, which is um, surprisingly much more inefficient. But if you go to the distributed way, so if you have three members uh, running Hazelcast, then you see that the local goes up from 38 to 56 milliseconds. So that's almost double in time because it needs to now really transfer all the data from the members to that, third, uh, to that one um, 
pr process where you are doing the filtering within Java. But that predicate and the SQL one, they hardly increase, the timing for them hardly increase because the Filtering is done on the three different members and only the data is retrieved and the result of the data is retrieved to that uh, process uh, via a micro, uh, which is um, handling that REST endpoint. So the SQL one, uh, it is stated in the Hazel cost documentation that you never should do local filtering and always use those predicate, but people are not, uh, uh, most of the time what I see are not using that because it is a bit specific and yeah, just a for loop for, for instance, within Java, we are we all used to, uh, uh, all the Java developers are used to, uh, to do that. But now with that SQL, they have uh, a very nice alternative because SQL is a quite known, um, uh, is quite known by the developers and is much easier to use and you have again, the same performance gains uh, that you have. Um, then with that uh, predicate as, because you are using the distributed power of, um, of Hazelcast. So I see there are a few questions. So let's see what comes in of questions. I answered most of them. The only one that I could not answer it because I don't know how you integrate Hazelcast exactly within Payara is if you can prevent like uh, clustering. So if, if you can have multiple Pyra nodes and they don't form a cluster, I, I could answer that question in Hazelcast <laughs> proper, but not in Pyra, unfortunately. Yep. Yes, we have the possibility to disable Hazelcast entirely, um, which means that they don't form a cluster, but that means also that you lose all the functionality which is related um, to uh, to Hazelcast because we are building some features, as I said, on top of Hazelcast. So within Payara server, um, you, I think you can disable um, Hazel, Hazelcast, but then um, some important features are missing and probably in, um, Payara server is not working properly anymore itself. With Payara micro, it is possible. And then you need to specify here on the command line um, uh, you can do Java minus jar. Uh, you can specify here no cluster. And then um, his, his, Hazelcast is not started. But again, I cannot start it here because that not, makes not, not, not much sense here because then I cannot store anything in the cache also. Um, but yes, with Payara, you can um, remove um, his, his, his Hazelcast from the process if you like. Any other questions? Joseph, did we answer, did Rudy answer your question? Ah, so I, I answered a question, but uh, Carlos wants to have your answer to that. Um, so the question of Carlos, yeah, I couldn't answer correctly. Like uh, I will read out the question out loud. So I'm under the impression that Hazelcast can be used as a second level cache for GPA provider in PyRK's Eclipse link. Is this correct? How? How also does it mean that two or more Pyara instances in the same data grid can share the cached GPA object? And so there is no need to each cache object individually, but rather all cached in Hazelcast. Yes. It is somewhere in the documentation. Um, and now I'm saying documentation, but it might be only for customers. But yes, you can define Hazelcast as the, the second level cache for JPA. And then indeed, queries are the results of the queries are stored within Hazelcast. And if you have then a cluster like I have, for instance, then um, it is available for all um, instances running in, in, in that cluster. If you find, if you do a search on the internet, um, Payara, um, JPA, um, JPA, um, Hazelcast JPA, um, 
cache, then probably you will find it. And otherwise, um, you can ping us as a, as a message and then we can find it for you. Antonio asks if Hazelcast has a RAM limit inside of Payara. Well, the issue is that actually, if you run Hazelcast embedded, then your server and Hazelcast, they share the same GVM, they share the same resources. So Rudy, can you, can you set an, a limit to Hazelcast inside of Payara? I'm afraid it's a no, but perhaps I, I'm missing there. No, it's it's a lim it's a, it's limited by the heap space that you provide to your process. So combined Hazel Hazelcast and um, and Payara, you can always run the Hazelcast a Hazelcast instance separately from um, from Payara. That's also possible, and that they join so that you have, for instance, only one um, instance of Payara micro running, but you have three. His Hazelcast instances running. So that's also a possibility. And then you can completely control the process that is running the Hazelcast uh, instances. So, I mean, it depends a lot on, on your requirements. Yes. If yes. you want to, to limit uh, the, the resources taken by Hazelcast, then you should probably limit the number of objects in the structure. So for example, you can say that your, your IMAP only can like store 100, 100 objects. That I, that's how I would approach it. Now, I mean, I, I, I don't feel super comfortable, but um, what, if you start to rely on hassle cost more and more, what you should probably do is the couple. Your, your problems. So I have a dedicated Hazelcast cluster and yes. then have a dedicated payer cluster and use each of them for their respective capabilities. That's what I, I would do. Uh, okay, I will try to answer another question. Antonio asked, my interest is about how much data I can load in Hazelcast. Well, as much as you want until you reach your, your, your memory limit. <laughs> and, and the problem, again, as I mentioned, you are sharing resource with Pyra itself, so you, you will be competing for resources. So if you have a huge heap, and of course, in that case, if you have a huge heap, you need to configure the heap correctly. That's, that's a skill in itself. Um, then you, you can store, uh, as, again, as much as, as your heap can contain. Yes. Yeah, indeed, the limitation is your heap size, or as you mentioned, uh, the configuration of um, your, your maps or your, your list yourself, if they can only contain a certain amount of items. That, that, that are the two ways of limiting um, your, re, your resources, your items within, within Hazelcast. Uh, Rudolf asks, I'm a bit surprised why the predicate method is about 30% slower than plan SQL. Do you know why? No, I don't know why, but I can check because yeah, I'm also a bit surprised by the result because I didn't know about the exact demo <laughs> that would you would do. Uh, so, uh, so I can check. Um, uh, I, I will ask uh, the priority team to remind me and then I will try to find the answer. That's a good question. Actually. But what my idea is, because I know the SQL one has a few limitations which are not there um, within the criteria one, within the predicate one. So I think just because there is, um, it is a simplified version, if I may call it like this, a simplified version of the predicate, the criteria one that, that is more optimized and can do its work better. But that's my idea. And again, I'm not an expert on Hazelcast code internally. Yeah, me uh, neither, so I will ask my engineers. <laughs> uh, Josef has another question. Do you have some best practice how to serialize data to Hazelcast cache because default Java serialization is sometimes slow? Well, uh, the good thing is by default, um, if you are like using Java, it will be uh, Java serialization, but actually we've got a lot of serialization options. You can use JSON, you can 
use uh, Avro. You, you, you can use basically anything you want. You can have your own schema. And I believe in Hazel cost five, uh, we, have, um, we have a serialization option, which is the, if none, so there, there is a fallback, there is a, a process where you fall back, does it implement serializable, does it implement and, and so on and so forth. And you, if nothing fits, then you've got a new serialization. And my engineering team told me that it's more efficient. And on the plus side, you can query that item. So either through SQL or through uh, the regular API without having the class on the class pass. So there is something called a generic record, and then you can call the generic record to say, hey, this field name, whatever, how, what is value? Um, so I don't know what you call best practices, but uh, if you uh, go to the uh, documentation of Hazelcast, you can see all the serialization formats that we support. So for example, if you want to share data with uh, other language stacks, then probably yeah, for score, of course, Java serialization wouldn't be good probably, and then it's best to serialize in JSON. Uh, so I, I would have to know more about the requirements, but please check the documentation. And of course, perhaps the documentation is not complete, but this one, I, I read it quite a few times and I, I feel it's good enough. Um, and I think you can find uh, the, the, the exact stuff that fits your, your use case. I have a colleague, for example, he implemented a serialization that used Cryo, which is one of the serialization formats available right now. I hope I answered the question. Um, and Josef, I still has one more question. So thanks for everybody for all the questions. That's very nice to see yes, that you are nice. engaged. Yeah. Uh, and that's for you. <laughs> okay. I don't want to disable Hazelcast at all in Payara, but sometimes it's fast to use local cache for every instance. So they, they just want to keep Hazelcasts, but they don't, they, they don't want to form a cluster. They want their own dedicated local cache in each Payara node. Yep, that's one of the features that uh, is in our pipeline that um, you can still use Hazelcast as Jcache, but that it does not form a cluster. You can do it already today, um, but you need to do some tweaking with the configuration. Uh, you can provide a configuration file where you disable the TCP IP listener, if I'm correct, uh, from Hazelcast, and then it does not form a cluster, but you have still have Hazelcast available in process uh, so, uh, for the, um, the Payara micro process. I think we, 5.0, that, that would be even easier because you've got auto discovery features. So you just disable it and, and it would be even easier. Okay. But that's indeed one of the uh, features which uh, is in our pipeline. Um, I have no date um, to announce for the moment when that can be available, but uh, it's it's definitely in, in, in our pipeline to, to have that uh, possibility. But Payara is open source, right? Yes, if, if someone wants to create uh, a PR for that, uh, we are ha happy to review it and accept it uh, if, it's a, if it's a valid one. So Rudolf asks if there is a Hazelcast SQL jar available as a Maven dependency, and the answer is yes, it's available as a normal Maven dependency. Um, and you should have it running uh, on the class pass, and then it will you can you can query it. That's also how I use the RUC. It is I'm taking it from my standard Maven repository. So the name is com Hazelcast, Hazelcast SQL, and then the version number. So yes, it is available as Maven artifact. I really appreciate all your questions. Do you still have some? There's a visit done yet. <laughs> uh, does exist some API to set up connection or read timeout between Payara and Hazel cost cache? I'm not sure I understand the question. No, um, I don't think that there, there is a um, timeout or whatever, because like here you just say, for instance, let's go for, here when you, you just ask for the data there, 
or there might be a low level thing, but again, I find that a bit curious that you want to say, retrieve me only the data which you can fetch me within half a second for something and drop the rest because then you have incomplete data. So I don't think you have that, um, that timeout. There is a, what's called a heartbeat between the different Hazelcast members. So um, they check regularly to see if they are still available. So um, all the instances and um, to see if there is something what's called uh, like a, uh, if one of the of one of the members is stopped or crashed or um, no no longer accessible, uh, what's called split brain um, syndrome that not all members can see each other anymore. So there, there is some configuration and some timeouts, but retrieving the data itself, I am not aware of such a functionality or um, configuration possibility. The famous split brain scenario. Yes. Everybody thinks that they are the master. <laughs> That's the reason why you should always run your cluster in an uh, odd number. Because when they rejoin, they, you, you, you need somebody to say, hey, I, I, am, I am correct. I, I, am, I have the truth. I am the truth holder. So if you've got, let's say, one in one, they split, they rejoin, and they all think that they, 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 they are the truth holder. So if you have like three, they split and probably did be one and two. So when they rejoined, the two ones, they will, they will have the quorum and they can say, hey, we, we know better than you. You should align your data to ours. Yep. So that, that, that's something to keep in mind. Always run your Payaya or your uh, Hazelcast instances uh, in uh, even uh, odd numbers. Yep. So three, five, uh, so three, but yep. I used five, seven, whatever. Minimum, of course, is three because one doesn't make any sense. No. <laughs> Only for local development, but yes. production not. It should be three. Three is the magic number. Fantastic. So I think we, we can call it a day. Yeah, thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you to the audience as well. Um, we will put this on uh, YouTube as well if you want to to catch it in our time. And um, I put in a link to the guide that we did uh, earlier in the year, because uh, that will have some of the content that we, uh, we covered previously. Um, is there anything else you'd like to mention about Hazelcast, Nicholas, or any events? I, I really in? want to, to thank all the good questions, because yeah, that's really, questions. I mean, I've been doing a lot of online webinars, and to have such engagements is very rare. So I really appreciate that. That's super motivating for me and probably also for you to do it again. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, very appreciate it, guys. Um, and as such, as if you do have any other questions that come up later, um, please get in touch um, through social media um, or, or through our websites. And um, Nicholas or, or Rudy uh, will be able to get back to you. Uh, we also have a forum um, as well. Uh, I can put the link in the chat. Um, and any questions there that are para orientated, uh, I'm sure we can uh, find an answer for you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Enjoy your day. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye.